We honor the Lord tonight for this wonderful privilege to gather together in the sanctuary to remember the work of Jesus Christ. To remember the worth of Jesus Christ. To even remember the witness of Jesus Christ. As he on the very last night of his life engaged in so much work to teach us what it meant to be a follower of Jesus Christ. One committed to the will of God for one's life. So tonight we come to reflect upon that. We come to be led again through the same old story. We come to reflect again on the same testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ as he, with just hours left to live, would teach us through his example what it meant to be a follower of God committed to God's will for one's life. Tonight, brothers and sisters, we've already sung that we want to be led to Calvary. <laughs> and that's, a, that's a dangerous song to sing. Because that makes us know that we don't just have triumphs in Christ. There will be some tribulations. There will be some trouble. There will be some tragedy. And if we say, lead me to Calvary, we've got to be willing to accept not just Sunday morning. We've got to accept Friday afternoon. And all too often, those of us who want to remove suffering and struggle from the Christian relationship, leap over Friday to jump to Sunday. The only way to get to Resurrection Sunday is to go by Good Friday afternoon. And before you get the Good Friday afternoon, you have to deal with the anguish of Thursday night. And that's really what it was. It was a night of anguish. I heard the Reverend Dr. Williams as she was reading scripture, as she concluded the scripture passage, she said, we're remembering the anguish of Jesus Christ. That's why that refrain said, lest I forget Gethsemane. And so we've come to this garden of Gethsemane tonight. We want to deal with it as we continue on this. Well, as really we conclude our series on prayer. We do believe that great things happen when God's people pray. Oh, we believe that. We believe that. We tried to make that clear over these past six weeks or so. That all of us ought to have an enduring prayer life. And we learned tonight some things about the Lord Jesus in his prayer life. We've recognized throughout scripture that all the time Jesus would take some time apart to pray. He would often just remove himself from the masses and he would pray. Tonight is one of those such times when he likewise begins to pray. I want to talk tonight for just about 35, 40, 45 minutes. I'm going to talk till I'm done. <laughs> don't, don't you clap don't you clap <laughs> how preached did we get to Calvary don't you clap <laughs> haven't preached since Wednesday I feel like preaching no since Tuesday so, so, so I want to talk tonight from the subject completing your assignment completing your assignment it's not good enough just to start it. You've got to be willing to complete it. I want to talk about completing your assignment. I don't know if you know it. I don't know if you've heard, but I grew up at Emmanuel Baptist Church. 8301 South Damon Avenue, Chicago, Illinois, 60620, where the Reverend Dr. L.K. Curry was my pastor. And when I grew up, we used to sing hymns all the time. Have I mentioned that to you all? We used to sing hymns all the time. I, I, I'm pretty good with hymns. I know quite a few of them. Um, had to learn all of them. You know, in most Baptist churches, they would say, let's sing verses 1, 2, and 4. At Emmanuel, you sang every verse that was ever written. Every verse that was ever written. Pastor Curry said if the writer didn't want you to re-sing the song, the verse, he wouldn't have written the verse. So he said, we got to sing them all. And we learned all these hymns when I was growing up. And one of those old school Baptist hymns was I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. Anybody remember that one? 
Anybody remember that one? I like that old song. Can we sing that a little bit together? Just, just the refrain, not a whole lot of it. But I want us to sing that just to remember something about the assignment that we have. I'm on the battlefield. I am on the battlefield for my Lord. sentiment of the Lord Jesus when he began his earthly ministry. But Pastor AJ, he knew from a child that he was going to be about his father's business. He knew at the age of 12 while confounding doctors and lawyers that he had an assignment on his life. But at the age of 30, he commenced that assignment. Can't you see him as he begins his ministry? Run back with me to the beginning, the commencement of the ministry of Jesus. For at age 30, the Lord Jesus is baptized in the Jordan by John. After being baptized by the Jordan, the Bible in the Jordan by John, the Bible says he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he fasted and prayed. And while there in the wilderness, he was tempted of the devil. Enemy tried to get him to be thwarted from his assignment. After he had been tempted by the devil for 40 days and 40 nights, the Bible says 
that the Holy Spirit strengthened him. And then he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He took a scroll from the minister, opened it to Isaiah chapter 61 and said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. To preach deliverance to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. The year of the Lord's favor is now being proclaimed through the lips of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a wonderful commencement to his ministry. That's a great first sermon. <laughs> That's a fabulous way to begin your first sermon. That's a wonderful way to commence the ministry, the assignment that God has placed on your life. I suspect you could hear him singing, I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. I remember when I preached my first sermon, <laughs> I felt real good. I was excited to proclaim the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. The, the church was packed. The saints were praying. And I thought I was ready to preach. It was a wonderful day. I remember that Sunday in August like it was yesterday. I can still see the sanctuary with all those saints with smiling faces, knowing that those folk were praying for me. I was excited. Young preacher, young teenage guy who was excited about what the Lord was about to do. I was one of those who didn't run from my call. No, I wanted to preach. There's a whole lot of people who run from their call and then they find out they can't run any longer and then they finally say, yes, Lord. No, I wasn't one of them. I was like, take me, Jesus, use me. I wanted to preach. I was excited about preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. There were three of us in Chicago in our sphere who were just like that. Three young preachers who were excited. We thought about the assignment that the Lord had placed on our lives. You already know Dr. Howard John Wesley. He's my running buddy. He, you know him, but you don't know Rem Ivy. That's Rem Ivy in the middle. And we three guys thought we were some preaching machines. Yes, we did. Why are you taking pictures of that, man? Why are you taking pictures of that? Yeah, we thought we were somebody back there in Chicago on the south side. We were the three preachers who knew that God had chosen to use us for such a time as... I mean, y'all are really taking pictures of that thing. Y'all killing me, Lord, have mercy. Those are my guys, and we still preach the gospel today. You know Dr. Wesley does. Dr. Dr. Ivy is preaching in Wisconsin, and I'm here in Texas, and I'm excited. We're still excited. We were enthralled. We were, we were just all over the place about our assignment. We thought for sure that we were going to be used by God to do great things, and we were excited about it because we thought that this awe-inspiring call and commission was always going to bring us joy. We thought, and because we had this call of God on our lives, y'all better sit down, I'm going to be a while. I thought that because I had this assignment on my life from God, that everything was going to be all right. Oh, you don't, have, you don't have any chairs? I'm sorry. There's one, y'all figured out. I, um, <laughs> I thought everything was going to be great. We thought that we were going to have the best of times. Because we were on the battlefield for our Lord. We had signed up. We were ready to go. We thought that because everybody was praying for us, patting us on the back, telling us that God was using us already, that things would be phenomenal, fantastic. We thought it was always going to be awe-inspiring, full of joy full of happy moments. I suspect Jesus may have had that premonition, perhaps. And as he got ready to begin the ministry, it seemed real good until there were those who started hating on him. There were those who, after his first sermon, <laughs> tried to knock him down, tried to get rid of him. But God had an assignment on his life and he could not complete that assignment on day one. He had to keep on going. The Bible helps us to understand that throughout those three years of ministry, the Lord was using Jesus in powerful ways. Miracles were being performed. Messages were being preached. It was an absolutely awe-inspiring journey. 
Yeah, there were some haters, but you can expect that. We understood what the scripture says. Woe to you when everybody speaks well of you. We understand that. You ought not ever want everybody to be impressed with you because you're doing something wrong. Every now and then, when you proclaim God's word, you're going to step on some toes. <laughs> when you're completing your assignment, someone's going to be agitated or aggravated, irritated by what you do. And so there's always going to be that. So Jesus kept on with the work that he was assigned to do. Yeah, yeah. Hear him now. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to do this. I've been anointed to do the work that the Father has assigned to my hands. And so he chose 12 men to help him with the assignment. These guys are supposed to walk with him every day, every night. They're supposed to be with him, assisting him along the journey. Here these 12 men are, 12 ordinary fellas, many of them fishermen. Others are tax collectors. Others, we don't even know what they did as, as their occupation. But these 12 men have been deputized by God to be utilized by Jesus to fulfill the assignment. To fulfill the assignment. They walk with them. They're a ragtag bunch of brothers. They've got to be trained, you understand, because if they're going to complete the assignment beyond the ministry of Jesus, they need to know how to do the work he's assigning them to do. And so there they are walking with Jesus. They're there serving with Jesus. They're watching Jesus as he completes, as he fulfills, as he engages his assignment. Until we get to that last week. That last week was a unique week, wasn't it? It starts out with great pomp and circumstance. If you were here Sunday, you know it's a loud and rambunctious experience on Palm Sunday. Everybody's excited about Palm Sunday except Pharisees, always somebody in the crowd hating. But there are a whole bunch of people who are excited and celebrating the fact that Jesus is coming into the holy city of Jerusalem. Hosanna is what they exclaim. It's a powerful day. And then the Bible says that every other day throughout that week, Jesus is in the temple teaching all those who would come and hear him. He's sharing the good news of the kingdom of God. And then comes Thursday. It's Passover time. All the devout Jews have made their way to the holy city of Jerusalem. And now that they're in Jerusalem, now that it's come to Thursday, Passover is beginning. Jesus takes his disciples into a large furnished upper room. To have that intimate meal with his fellas. The guys are now at that last night of the life of Jesus Christ. They're not really sure why Jesus keeps saying, I don't know, I'm going, they, these, these men are going to be betraying me and they're going to lead me into the hands of wicked men. I'm going to die, but I'm going to get up. They don't like that. But now the rubber has to hit the road. And now Jesus takes them into this, this upper room. He feeds them. They eat this Passover meal together. He takes from the Passover meal on Thursday night those two elements, bread and wine. And he gives to them the bread saying, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. He gives them the wine. Drink it all. For it is the new covenant in my blood. They don't understand it all. They can't get it all. He's washed their feet. He's shown to them that if you're going to be my disciples, you can't just always have your feet washed. Sometimes you got to bow down and wash somebody else's feet. We're not just called to be people who are served. We are called to be servants ourselves. So the Lord Jesus teaches them by example, girding himself with a towel, stooping down to wash their feet. And now they have seen some things. They have experienced some things. And John's gospel says that from chapter 13 to chapter 17, Jesus teaches them. He sits them down after a long meal, after having a wonderful experience with bread and wine, after having their feet washed. He sits them down and teaches them. And when he teaches them this long extended discourse on discipleship, he lets them know, listen, if you're going to be my disciples, you've got to have love one for another. That's why you already heard it, but that's why we call this Maundy Thursday. From the Latin word mandatum, mandatum meaning mandate. It is a mandate that if you're going to be my disciple, you have to have love one for another. You are not my disciple just because you come to church. You are not my disciple just because you have an app on your phone that says Holy Bible. You are not my disciple just because you wave palm branches on Palm Sunday. You must love one another if you're going to call yourselves my disciples. And not just the lovable ones. 
got to love those who are unlovable. You've got to love those who do not show love back. You've got to love those who hate you, despitefully use you. Jesus says, love your enemies. Love every one of these persons that come your way. That's how people will know that you are my disciples. That's the mandate Jesus gives to them. They eat the Lord's Supper and the Bible says they leave from the upper room singing a hymn. Maybe they sang glory to his name. <laughs> I don't know what they sang, but they sang as they left from that holy space. But Jesus leads them to a place called the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives. And when he gets to the foot of the Mount of Olives, the base of the Mount of Olives, he goes into a beautiful garden. It's a lovely space. It's a gorgeous space. This beautiful garden called Gethsemane. It's a garden to which they've gone on multiple occasions. Jesus retreated to this place quite regularly. And now they are there in this beautiful space. This is the space literally where you will see uh, the words of the, of the writers of, in the Holy Land saying that this is the place where the Lord Jesus came with his disciples on the last night of his life. And there in that beautiful space. They find out something while being with Jesus that is most necessary for us to understand. That sometimes our assignments are awe-inspiring. But church family, we need to understand that sometimes those awe-inspiring assignments can turn to agonizing assignments. Oh, may I please tell you on this Monday Thursday that agonizing assignments are often authorized by the Almighty. <laughs> agonizing assignments are often authorized by the almighty that God will sometimes lead us to agonizing experiences listen we said that the Lord Jesus goes now to the to the garden of Gethsemane when he goes he takes all 11 of the disciples that are left you will recall that before they left the upper room Judas had left the place to do what he was going to do Jesus says whatever you're going to do go do it quickly so Judas had left the room. Jesus now takes the remaining 11. They go to the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus leaves uh, eight of those brothers at the mouth of the garden. And he takes his, <laughs> his ride or die crew. He takes that threesome that he has taken on special assignments with him before. He takes Peter, James, and John farther into the garden. And this is what he says. He says, stay here. Sit here with me and pray. Watch and pray. So that you don't enter into temptation. He's now telling them that when you're going into this last round of the assignment, you've got to have some prayer coming from you that's going to assist you to go to the next space of your life. You cannot handle it all by yourself. And so he says, I need you to pray. You often need some prayer partners, don't you? You often need somebody who you know has got your back in prayer. It helps to know that somebody's calling your name in prayer. He asks those three disciples, stay right here and pray. And the Bible says in Luke's gospel that he goes a stone's throw away he goes a stone's throw away not not too far but he goes far enough so that now he's by himself and when he prays by himself listen again to the words you heard Dr. Williams read to us he says my father if it's possible let this cup pass from me Metaphor of the cup is the suffering, it is the agony, it is the death. The metaphor of the cup is that which causes frustration, anxiety. He says, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Now, church family, you've got to watch what Jesus is doing. He is now praying to God, asking him that this last portion of the assignment can be put on hold, if not canceled. I need to know if I can skip this part right here. I need to know if since I did everything else you told me to do, can we let this part right here just be erased from the assignment? If it's possible. Let this cup pass from now. You got to understand, Jesus is at a place now where you and I have often been. He's at a place, watch what he says, my soul is overwhelmingly sorrowful. I'm in a place where my soul is hurting. <laughs> 
This internal anguish is significant and real. This, my brothers and sisters, is not the I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. This is when your song turns to sighing. This is when your joy turns to weeping. This is when you can't really feel that passion with which you started. This is not the spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is God take this away from me. And don't you fool yourself. There will be some seasons where you and I will find ourselves in an agonizing moment when we want the cup to pass from us now. Now, 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 I hear somebody saying, no, whatever the Lord's will is for my life, that's what I want to do with your super spiritual self. No, you just haven't been at the right point of anguish. Listen, church, this is Jesus praying. Perfection is praying. And perfection says, I need this to pass from me. And there's somebody sitting on your row right now who can testify. There have come some seasons where you like, Lord, if you can please find another way. God, if you can please take another path. God, will you please turn this thing around and modify this experience? I don't want to go through this. There come some times when agonizing assignments come our way. And these are the times when you can't say, Satan, the Lord rebuke you. This is not the time for Jesus to say, get thee behind me, Satan. This is not the time for Jesus to say, I'm more than a conqueror. I shall not have to endure this satanic experience because this ain't Satan. This ain't the devil. This here is God. I came to tell somebody there are some seasons when agonizing assignments are authorized by the Almighty. Authorized. Ask Job, he'll tell you. Ask, ask Paul, he'll tell you. And sometimes the Lord will lower the hedge that's around you with your spared self with your anointed self. Sometimes the Lord will allow a messenger of Satan to buffet you. There are some assignments that are agonizing, not all inspiring now. This ain't use me in your service, Lord. This is change your mind, God. And I submit tonight that some of us are going to have to begin to come to grips with the fact that there'll be some seasons when we want the Lord to change his mind. There'll be some seasons where we want the Lord to find another way. There'll be some seasons and the truth of the matter is that no matter how much you pray, the matter will not change. Oh, now we get to the real crux of this prayer business. We had been talking for the last several weeks about how prayer changes things. Well, what if prayer doesn't change the thing? Can you still believe God if the matter doesn't get shifted? <laughs> Can you still love God if the situation isn't reversed? Can you still bless the Lord? Come to church with your hands lifted up and celebrate God if God never changes the situation. Listen to the words of the Lord Jesus. If it's possible, and apparently because God never says it is, it ain't. It's not possible for the cup to pass from him. And listen, and this is not just Jesus praying one little prayer. This is Jesus praying multiple times about the same situation. Did you hear the preacher read? She said to us that he prayed one time for a whole hour. He prayed a second time for a whole hour. He prayed a third time for a whole hour. And the answer never came back. Okay. God never said, I'm going to do it the way you want. 
because notice the little, little, little caveat that Jesus places in the prayer. According to your will, mm, not my will, but thy will be done. And some seasons of our lives will have to acquiesce to the reality that God's will will bring anguish, will bring agony, will bring some anxiety. Oh, this is where we grow up in God. This is when God matures us. This is when we pray for the loved one and the loved one doesn't get healed but dies. This is when we pray that the business will flourish and the business falters. This is when we pray that the children will come back and do right and the child never returns, stays in the far country. This is when we prayed that the marriage would be salvaged and it does not come back to reconciliation. Oh, come on. Let's talk tonight. Let's talk about the reality that sometimes sickness is unto death. Sometimes the pink slip will be placed on your desk. Sometimes the disease will hit your body with your vegan self. All that juicing you've been doing. <laughs> yes you work out four times a week and you still have to deal with a thorn in your flesh agonizing assignments are often authorized by the almighty and may I make bad matters a little bit worse I submit tonight that not only are, are agonizing assignments often authorized by the Almighty, sometimes those who are, who, are, who are appointed to assist you won't be accountable to you. Th those assigned, appointed to assist you won't be there to help you out. Did I, did I mention that Jesus took 11 disciples to the, to the garden? Th those are supposed to be his ride or die brothers. Did I mention that to you? Um, he takes them to the garden. He leaves eight of them at the mouth of the garden. He goes farther in with three of his disciples because he knows those are his ride or die brothers. He knows good and well he can depend on them if nobody else. Peter, James, and John are taken farther into the garden. They're just a throwing stones throw away from where Jesus is. But after that first hour, Jesus comes back and finds them sleeping. Now, church, this has been an hour of prayer. This has been, it's been what the saints call a sweet hour. Y'all know it. A sweet hour of prayer. Y'all remember? Y'all remember that hymn? Wait, remember old school church that could help me sing? Um, uh, sister, one of the sisters of our church asked that before this press season was over that we sing this song. I don't see it tonight. I hope she's streaming because we're about to sing sweet hour of prayer. If you know it, sing it with me. Sweet, sweet hour. hour. Uh -huh. That calls me from a world of care. In seasons of in seasons of distress and grief, and grief. my soul has often found me.
That sounds good, doesn't it? Sweet hour of prayer. But church family, that's not what Jesus just had. That was not a sweet hour of prayer. He was not engaged in that pleasant, pleasurable, pleasing hour of prayer. Your Bible says in Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 22, that while he was praying, sweat like drops of blood were falling from his brow. There come some seasons, church, where our prayer time is not pleasurable. There come some seasons where our prayer time is not pleasing or pleasant. That's where Jesus is, not at the sweet hour of prayer. And if that wasn't bad enough that the sweat like drops of blood were falling from his brow, when he goes back to his boys, his boys are sleeping. This has to be a challenge. I thought I could depend on these fellas. I've been feeding them for three years. Thought I could depend on them. I've shown them miracle after miracle. I've Help them to understand what the kingdom looks like. And now they're sleeping. I, I suspect <laughs> that it makes sense that they're sleeping. Come on, did you, did you hear what I said they had been doing all day? All night long, they had been with Jesus hanging out. They had had a wonderful meal. Whenever you get a chance, look up the Passover meal. It's a lavish meal. They got lamb and herbs and everything is going on at that meal. It's a wonderful meal. And then he took from that meal two elements, bread and wine. <laughs> All of that has been at the meal. And those who are laughing the most know what wine will do to you. It can make you sleepy. So I'm told. Wine can make you listless. And they're in the garden. Look at how beautiful it is. This is a wonderful place to take a nap. This is a great spot after a fabulous meal to nod off for a little while and enjoy some slumber. Jesus, you take care of that prayer business. We'll just take a nice nap. And so they go to sleep and Jesus comes back, wakes them up, say, come on, can't you pray with me for just an hour? He says, watch and pray so that we won't fall into temptation. He goes back, prays another hour. He comes back, they're sleeping again. He goes back after waking them up, say, can't you, can't you pray with me? Why can't you pray with me? You need to pray with me. Go back and, and, and go and get some prayer time in. And the Bible says that while they're supposed to be praying, while they're supposed to be praying, they can no longer do it because the night, help him, help him, help him. The night has worn them out. Night has worn them out. It can get difficult. Stay with me. They got him. They got him. It can get difficult, church family, for us to keep on, keep on going through the paces we're supposed to be going through when the pressure gets real. And the Bible says that because they couldn't stay up with him, we learn something very significant, that sometimes those who are assigned to assist you cannot stay with you because the agony is too severe. Don't, don't, don't get upset when folk can't hang with you through your rough seasons. Watch this. It's not their assignment. And some things are learned, watch, in the crucible of isolation that you can't learn in the wonder of community. Mm. Did you hear what I just said? I said some things we have to learn in the crucible of isolation. Sometimes God has to get us apart from the crowd, away from everybody else, away from everybody lauding us and applauding us to teach us some things in isolation. Ain't no hosannas now. No, this is not the time for hosanna. This is not the time, my brothers and sisters, for everybody who's in the multitude to be thronging you. 
There's some seasons where you have to learn some things by yourself. I come to the garden alone. Alone. There's some times where you and I, my brothers and sisters, have to deal with the reality that only some things can be learned. Some things can only be learned with you and God. And God deliver us from always having to be dependent on somebody else. One, two, three, four, five, six. I need, I need a whole crowd right through here. We have to pray sometimes for deliverance from dependence. Because we can get so codependent on everybody that we always need somebody patting us on the back. Always need somebody telling us, go on, you got it, you, we with you, we with you. Sometimes you got to believe that you and God make up the majority. Sometimes you got to believe that if God be for you, who can be against you? I need some witnesses in here who still believe that even if nobody else goes, I'll go if I have to go by myself. That's the song they used to sing in Coldwater, Mississippi. At my mama's home church. My mama's sitting over here. Second Baptist Church in Coldwater, Mississippi. She used to ship me off every summer to Coldwater, Mississippi so she could have the summer to herself. And every Sunday at Second Baptist Church in Coldwater, Mississippi, the choir would profess from the back of the church and they'd sing the same song every Sunday. I'll go if I have to go by myself. We never knew where they were going, but they were on their way somewhere. They understood that sometimes you have to deal with certain circumstances in the crucible of isolation. I'm done with the little message. I need to tell you that some stuff even praying won't get you out of. Some stuff even praying won't deliver you from. I'm telling you the truth because the Bible says that Jesus still has to complete the assignment even though he asks the Father to take it from him. Listen to him. My Father, if it's possible, take this cup from me. I like this. He gets it personal, Dr. Mitchell. He does not say our Father like he taught us in the model prayer. He says, our Father, when it's, when it's one of those corporate prayers, everybody ought to be praying in that model. When it gets real serious, when the rubber meets the road, when you really need that thing to be taken from you, it's my Father. Come on, I know you, I know you. As a matter of fact, the Aramaic is Daddy in Mark chapter 14. He says, Daddy, come on, this is personal. We've got a relationship. And even your relationship can't release you. Even all that singing you do in the choir. It can't spare you. I mean, y'all play for four services every Sunday, and you still got to go through some drama. I mean, you called, you anointed, you ordained to do the work of ministry, and you still have to go through some seasons of struggle and anguish. I mean, you serve the Lord with gladness. You come before his presence with singing, and you still have to deal with agonizing assignments. But don't, 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 don't leave the scene too fast. Stay in the garden for a little while. Listen to that verse. I'd stay in the garden with him, though the night around me be falling. Stay in the garden for a little while longer. Because although you find out that agonizing assignments are often authorized by the Almighty, and although you understand that those who are assigned to assist you won't always be accountable to you, Luke's gospel gives us a pretty good switch, a pretty good spin on the story. Because Luke's gospel says that while Jesus is agonizing after three hours of prayer, while Jesus is agonizing, here's a beautiful little piece of scripture that happens in Luke chapter 22 at verse 43. The Bible says that an angel was dis dispatched to aid the Lord Jesus. Now, whew, don't miss it. Don't miss it. He, he thought he was by himself, Deacon Mamie. He thought that he was not going to be, get any better. He thought he was just going to deal with this sweat like drops of blood falling from his head. But the Bible says that in the midst of the agony, in the midst of the anguish, in the midst of even the anger, I suspect, God dispatched an angel from heaven and the angel came and strengthened him. May I tell you that every now and then, 
God, God will make angels available to come to your aid. He'll, he'll let angels come to aid you. That God often will allow assigned angels to assist you with your assignment. You do not have to always deal with it by yourself. I know you thought they were your ride or die. I know you thought they would be the ones who'd always help you through everything. Oh, uh, that's why the Old Testament says some trust in horses. Some trust in chariots, but we will trust in the name of the Lord. I need two or three people in here who understand that when you put your trust in God, you never know how God's going to bless you. You never know how God is going to work it out. You never know how God is going to assist you. you got to complete your assignment, but somebody needs to know if God be for us, he's, who can be against us? He's going to enable us to complete the assignment we have begun. I like that. Angels were sent to strengthen him. Have you ever had somebody show up to strengthen you you never anticipated would be the one? Have you ever had God dispatch somebody into your life that gave you just what you needed to keep on going? You ever have somebody you never thought coming would make their way into your situation and let you know that this too shall pass? I like this about Jesus. He helps us to understand that when you get angelic assistance, it strengthens you. It toughens you up. It lets you know, hold up, <laughs> you're going to complete this assignment. How do I know that? Because in chapter 22, I'm sorry, in, chap in, in, in Matthew's gospel, chapter 26, at verse 42, 46, the Bible says that Jesus left that third hour of prayer, went to his disciples, still sleeping. He said, get up, rise. It's time to go. Here comes my betrayer. Oh, you missed it. You missed it. Let me give it to you again. Um, in the previous verses, he's wondering why these boys keep going to sleep. He's troubled by the fact that they keep going to sleep on him. But when God dispatches an angel to strengthen him, he's no longer worried about the folk who couldn't go all the way. He now goes back to them and said, come on, brothers, you ain't got to help me. God sent some help for me and everything's going to be all right. Come on, let's go. It's time to go into the last hours of my life. It's time to go into the roughest part of my journey. But I believe I got power now to keep on going, even though I felt like giving up. And I came tonight to tell somebody, if you keep on praying some kind of way, God is going to dispatch some angelic assistance to give you just what you need, just when you need it most. My brother, my sister, be not weary in well-doing. In due season you will reap if you do not faint. Can I find 10 or 12 people in every section tonight who will testify the only reason I'm still living, the only reason I'm still surviving, the only reason I'm still going with this assignment is because angels keep showing up to strengthen me. <laughs> Glory to his name. Glory to his name. I said glory to his name. Hallelujah. I don't know who's in Gethsemane tonight. I don't know who has sweat like blood falling from your brow. I don't know who's been angry because your friends and family couldn't help you out. I don't know who's been disappointed because your assignment you thought wasn't supposed to go down like this. I don't know who started out gung-ho and now you just kind of lacks a days ago. I don't know who it is, but somebody needs to know you can't give up now. You can't stop praying now. You cannot throw in the towel now. If you keep praying, at some point along the way, God is going to dispatch an angel to come to your rescue. And you'll be able to say, all right, I feel like going on. I feel like pressing on. I feel like going a little farther. I feel like everything's going to be all right. I feel a little pep coming back to my steps. Anybody in here know what I'm talking about? Won't he do it? So my word to somebody tonight, keep on praying. 
if Jesus had to keep praying, watch, the same prayer. That's what Reverend read. The same prayer. Notice, the prayer does not change. Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Father, take it, take it away from me. I don't want to deal with this. And God never gives him the answer he was looking for, but he gave him exactly what he needed. He said, no, I'm not going to take the cup. This is why you came into the world. You didn't come just to preach some nice sermons. You didn't come just to turn some water into wine. You didn't come just to feed multitudes of bread and fish. You came to die. You came to give your life as a ransom for many. You came so that even if they took your life on Friday, I'd restore it on Sunday. So get up, square your shoulders, and let's